Jeremy Scahill is author of Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army. He is an award-winning investigative journalist and correspondent for the national radio and TV program Democracy Now! He is also a Puffin Foundation Writing Fellow at the Nation Institute. When I've been running around the country over the past year talking about Blackwater, I've been approached numerous times by people who sort of say, you know, are you afraid that somebody's going to bump you off, you know, because these guys, these guys are, you know, tough guys with guns and stuff. And I, I, I've started saying to people when they ask, you know, do you have any protection? I say that my, my protection is the fact that IVAW is standing against the war. Uh, because... <laughs> You know, with, all the, with all this talk lately of, of that 3 a.m. phone call, uh, the, the members of IVAW understand that the only way we can ensure peace in this world is to have people in office who make it so that 3 a.m. phone calls don't happen. I, I also want to say I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be here uh, among you and to have been invited to come and, and, and join you today. Uh, I, I also want to thank personally the members of IVAW, and I've had a chance to meet uh, many of you uh, over the course of my uh, travels, uh, for being so clear on something that even sectors of the peace movement have been unable to be clear on, and that is that there needs to be an unconditional immediate withdrawal from Iraq and a payment of reparations to the Iraqi people. The, the logic of, of you broke it, you bought it has a lot of flaws as it's floated by democratic legislators and some people even identifying themselves as anti-war. What we have is a situation where you stab someone repeatedly over the course of an hour. You leave their body there to die and then you approach them, you dip a band-aid in poison and stick it on them and you say, things are getting better this person's going to be cured. That's where the, what the break it, bought it logic leads to. The reality is that as long as there is 10 or 20 U.S. soldiers in Iraq as an occupation force, there will be the incredible violence suffered by the Iraqi people that we see right now. It will continue to be flypaper uh, for, for those who want to attack U.S. soldiers. It will continue to give Iran a much greater hand in Iraq. There are very mainstream, to use their phrase, reasons why the United States should not be in Iraq right now. But that's not the focus of, of what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I've been investigating Blackwater for several years now, and I want to tell you a couple of, of stories from the recent investigations that I've been doing, not so much focus on what I've been talking about over the past year. And I want to begin with, with an incident that I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with. Uh, it happened on the afternoon of September 16, 2007, in Baghdad's Nisr Square. Uh, a young Iraqi medical student named Haitham al Rubai, who's 20 years old, was driving his mother, who also was a doctor. They had just dropped off their father, uh, his father, himself a doctor. Uh, medicine was in his uh, DNA. They got into the square that day. They were going to be running some errands, dropping off college applications for uh, his sister. And when they pulled into the square, at the same time that they arrived, a convoy of vehicles approached going the wrong way on a one-way street. I'm sure this story sounds familiar to soldiers who were in Iraq. These vehicles, which were reportedly South African Mamba armored vehicles, entered Nisar Square. They drove the wrong way down a one-way road, Iraqi police scrambled to cut off traffic as they often have to do, not for the protection of the armored vehicles, but for the protection of Iraqi civilians who may have the lethal misfortune of getting too close to these vehicles. One car was unable to stop quick enough, and one of the gunmen atop the South African Mamba armored vehicle shot a bullet right through the head of the 20-year-old medical student. His car came to a semi-stop, but it was an automatic transmission car and it kept rolling a bit toward the armored vehicles. His mother was clutching her son's bloodied body. Iraqi policemen ran over to her and they heard her yelling, my son, my son, and they tried to pull the woman from the car and to stop the vehicle. They saw men in the other armored vehicles 
aiming their weapons at the vehicle. The Iraqi policemen were yelling at them not to shoot, that they were civilians in the car. And then the men inside of the armored vehicles continued to light up that vehicle, and they blew up the car with the mother inside holding her dead son's body. They launched some kind of projectile at the vehicle, and it engulfed it in flames, and the mother and her son were melded together. Their flesh melted into one another. That was the beginning of a 15-minute shooting spree, during which 17 Iraqi civilians, among them very young children and women, were killed. Several of the Iraqi victims, all of them civilians, were shot as they were running away from the scene or as they sat trapped in their vehicles. The shooters that day in the square were not U.S. soldiers, at least not on active duty, nor were they Iraqi insurgents. They were heavily armed mercenaries who worked for Blackwater USA, recently renamed Blackwater Worldwide. In the aftermath of that 15-minute shooting spree, the Iraqi government was under the mistaken impression that it was sovereign and ordered Blackwater to leave the country. For three days, Blackwater stopped escorting U.S. officials in and out of the Green Zone. Their operations were shut down. And what that meant was that the Green Zone was turned into the Green Zoo. Not a single U.S. occupation official that was non-military was able to leave the Green Zone because Blackwater was not guarding them. So central had that force become to U.S. occupation activities. And an indication of how important Blackwater was to the White House at the time, when Condoleezza Rice called Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki ostensibly to apologize, she made it clear to him Blackwater would be going nowhere. The Iraqi government interviewed witnesses, and they issued their repeated uh, a demand that Blackwater leave, and then they, just leave it, and then they uh, said that they intended to prosecute the killers as murderers in Iraqi courts. Now, well, hold on a second. That's, yes, if, if, we, if we lived in a just world, and if there was a sovereign Iraqi government, these individuals would have been handed over to the Iraqi courts. But as you all well know, one of Paul Bremer's last acts, the day before he skulked out of Baghdad in June of 2004, was to issue an edict known as Order 17, which granted a sweeping immunity to all contractors from prosecution in Iraqi courts. And he did this at a time when the, when the U.S. was saying they were handing over sovereignty to the Iraqi governments. It's a strange definition of sovereignty to defang a country's legal system or judicial system or court system while at the same time saying, here's your sovereignty. What we saw in the aftermath of Nisar Square was pushback from the White House. Within three days, Blackwater was back on the streets of Iraq, armed and dangerous. They remain there to this moment. Their contract is up for automatic renewal in May. Unless someone makes the decision to cancel it, it will be automatically renewed. The State Department began a cover-up of those killings and an attempt to immunize the individual shooters from prosecution on orders from the Bush administration, from the highest levels of power in Washington.